What's up, everybody? Coach Rob here, and it's another broadcast and another awesome interview I have lined up for you today. I had the honor and privilege of interviewing Pim Jansen. Pim Jansen is a nutritionist, a certified life coach, helping people on a ketogenic diet and on a carnivore diet um, deal with their carb-addicted brains, as she likes to say, and emotional eating problems to help them stop cheating themselves and stay consistent of their way of eating. And it's very common out in the ketogenic carnivore space for those influencers out there that recommend and help people uh, adopt a more animal-based or ancestral diet. Uh, many make it seem like it's just a matter of just flipping a switch. You go from this way of eating to now this way of eating, and many never really talk about the uh, severe level of difficulty that many have overcoming their physiological and emotional addictions to carbohydrates uh, and other more hyper palatable foods. And it makes it very, very difficult to make that transition and be consistent with it. And it does take time, as many of you know. But even once you overcome the physiological issues of getting off that glucose roller coaster, and then many notice that some of their cravings and hunger uh, goes away, there's still that emotional element, that mental element that stays there, that addictive nature. And we know that sugar um, reacts to the pleasure center of our brain as, uh, as uh, bad as nicotine or cocaine. So it's not an easy thing to overcome. And Pim Jansen, that's what she does. That's what she specializes in. And uh, we had a fantastic discussion. I know you're going to enjoy it. And uh, I think it's going to be helpful for so many out there, including even my own clients. And I really enjoyed this conversation. So, hey, this is another one that you're going to want to listen to all the way through because we cover so many cool hot button topics, uh, getting off of carbs. Um, we even talk about art the artificial sweetener issues. You know, we go down so many rabbit holes with this. It's really, really cool. And I think it's going to be really helpful. So, and as always, I need your help to grow this channel. I'm just a little guy out there trying to compete with the big fish. Um, and I'm trying to really up my YouTube game and get the message out there. So if you would honor me by please smashing that subscribe button, hitting the little thumbs up, dude, and leave a comment. I'd love to hear from you. That really goes a long way to push those algorithms out there into the universe and get this content out there to more like-minded people or maybe those who may be seeking something like this to help them reach their genetic best through training and nutrition. So anyway, you're probably tired of hearing me rant on. So without further ado, I want to get right to the interview that I had with Pim Jansen. Enjoy. Okay, everybody, here we are. I'm super excited about this one. I know I always say that before these interviews, but this one is near and dear to me because as a coach, I work with so many different people from so many walks of life. And out there in the carnivore space and the ketogenic space, there is so much disinformation. There's so much dogma. There's so much zealotry. And it's not just easy as just flipping a switch and changing lifestyle from one to, an, to the next. There are so many facets of things that are involved here and addictions, food addictions, physiological, psychological, all these things come into play. And today I have somebody who is on the cutting edge of this, who's an expert in this. And I'm super excited to have Pim Jansen on my show. I've been wanting to do this for a long time. I'm a big fan. I'm, I'm a subscriber and everybody else should be too, by the way. Go to her channel after this and subscribe uh, because this one is going to be very relevant and very important. Pim Jansen, it is so great to have you on this channel. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for your introduction. You are too sweet. <laughs> oh, no, not at all. I mean, it's it's... I know what you do and I'm excited about it, but maybe not everybody out there is familiar with what you do. So why don't you give all the viewers out there a brief introduction as to who you are, kind of where you come from, your story to kind of really set the table here for everybody. Right. So um, 
obviously, my name is Pim and I'm I'm a double certified life coach and I'm a nutritionist and I have a bachelor's degree in biomedical science. And the only thing I'm using right now is my uh, my life coaching skills and I'm using them to help preferably low carb people, keto carnivores who are either suffering from emotional eating or they're just struggling to stick on the diet. So usually people who may or may not identify as carb addicts and I don't want to exclude people who think that they just have a bad habit because a bad habit is just the beginning stage of an addiction I believe for most people so um, I have probably been sugar addicted since uh, a very young age I have memories from when I was about six years old you know my mom she's she's a night owl so I used to get up early in the morning climb the chairs and I knew where she was hiding the cookies in the cupboard and I would be stretching and getting them and I I remember specifically trying to always like just I couldn't take one but if I had two she probably wouldn't notice and I don't think she ever did because <laughs> I told this story when I was on Meet RX and for some reason she watched that one and she was like you stole my cookies <laughs> <laughs> busted <laughs> yeah busted but now it's like 40 years later so I'm okay with it <laughs> wow. That's a great but story. That was my but, behavior. Yeah. Go, yeah, yeah. Please continue. Yeah. So so that's my first memory. And I don't remember it a lot from my childhood. But as I grew up, I know that it, it was kind of custom for us to go to the supermarket at the break in school, a lunch break. And I always get something. I'm Swedish. So we got something called kexhoklad, which is like a chocolate wafer thing. And I will get one of those every lunch. Or I would run home because I'm a very picky eater and I just boil me some pasta with salt and butter. That was my <laughs> lunch. So not the most nutritious diet. And this just escalated over time as addictions do. You, the more you eat, the more tolerant you're going to be to it and the, the more you need of them. So I just started eating more and more. I was working as a personal trainer and the diet advisor and I could not stop. I wasn't fat or probably even overweight because I was exercising a lot, but I think I did so much damage to my metabolism by eating this way. So I ate healthy <laughs> according to what I believed was healthy at the time. I ate six times per day because that's how you're supposed to balance your blood sugar. Yep. yep. And um, I was calculating all the macros, all the nutrients, making sure that my diet had everything. And then I had the sugar on top. Mm -hmm. It was like my excuse for doing that. And um, at some point when I was studying nutrition, I had one classmate. She was the one that was overweight in the class and she was into keto diets. And I'm like, I don't really know what this keto is. <laughs> and she was praising it. And the teachers were like, no, it's dangerous. We can't do that. That There's no scientific evidence for that. So obviously I got curious. <laughs> sure. And I had to try it myself because I was... As I said, I wasn't overweight, but compared to my colleagues, I always had some baby fat on. And I think that's that's the sugar part. So I never got rid of that. So I tried it and I lost weight. My cravings disappeared. Everything was fine until I developed some hybrids. And I thought, yeah, I can do this. So I had I also worked extra in a bakery like every Wednesday evening and every other Saturday. And when they have like broken stuff, you're allowed to eat it. And they had <laughs> these bro broken pralines. And I was like, I'll, I'll just have one. And that went fine. I just had one. And I was like, that was amazing. <laughs> Look at me. Look at what I can do. <laughs> <laughs> so the next Wednesday, I was like, yeah, here we go, pralines. They are safe. One led to, I don't know how many there were, which led to eating more at home. And here we go again. I was right. off. And right. after that, I have never had the same experience going on any low-carb, keto, carnivore diet. I, I still had the cravings. It's like I was teaching my brain that even though we are low-carb and we don't necessarily have the physiological cravings anymore because the blood sugar is stable, mm -hmm. we still have cravings and we're still going to want to eat it. And it feels really good when you do it. So That's so interesting the way you simply break that down. And I think so many people are going to resonate with that. They're like, okay, from a physiological level, I'm not craving, but you know, mentally 
there's something going on yeah. there, the way my brain is wired and it's a difficult process. And, you know, we, I grew up the same way. I remember when I was a child, you know, I would get up early on Saturday mornings and, you know, over <laughs> here you get up in the morning and you're a kid and you're behind the TV watching cartoons. And I would literally have a box of frosted flakes you know, Tony the Tiger with my hand those. in it, just, just doing that for like an hour watching morning cartoons until my parents got up and then took it away from me. And and somehow if I added milk to it, it was going to be okay, but I wasn't supposed to just be eating it out of the box, but I, I completely understand <laughs> that. And, and then just like you, you know, early, like back in the 1990s, when I was doing a very, you know, we'll call it traditional bodybuilding kind of training protocol, I was eating six times a day and I thought that's how you regulate blood sugar and you need that constant influx of, you know, nutrition in order to, you know, sustain muscle mass, blah, blah, blah. And it was tons of carbs, tons of protein, almost no fat. And it wasn't until 2004, roughly, that I, you know, stumbled onto a more paleo primal kind of way of eating. And that just developed over time and going down rabbit holes and seeing that word ketogenic and what is that? And Next thing you know, and and I was been quietly doing keto since about 2010, and then the the wave hit in 2015, at least over here, when keto just exploded, mm -hmm. and that's when the floodgates opened for me to be a coach, not only with strength training and hypertrophy training, but everybody wanted to know how they could incorporate a lower carb diet, ketogenic diet, and now carnivore diet, with hard training, which is extremely doable. But um, when did you make the conversion? into more carnivore or, or what another, let me back up. How are you eating now? And how did that develop? Uh, okay. So right now I'm probably, let's say I'm carnivore, let's say four days per week. Okay. Roughly on average. I'm just thinking the other days I might have about 10 grams of carbs or something. Cause I might be eating some blueberries and yogurt. Oh, a big and 10 grams. <laughs> I yeah, because everybody's expecting you to say them. like 30, 40, 50 grams. And you're like, yeah, no, I'm carnivore, but then I have 10 grams of carbs. I, I'm the type of yeah. cook be in, like, in oh, the form of fine, blueberries. you know, <laughs> okay, yeah. great. All right. I'm sorry. So, go ahead. So obviously, there's some plant matter in my diet. Um, and then I did a 90 day zero carb experiment. It wasn't actually zero, but kind of carnivore experiment last year. And what happened was that. I'm stubborn. I wanted to kind of go with it and actually do the 90 days. But the last six weeks, I was suffering from extreme fatigue, headaches and migraines every single day. And it took me probably a month and a half or two months to go back to feeling my normal self again after that. So I'm not doing that again. And it's a very specific headache. I can feel the difference between this type of headache and a sinus headache or another type of headache. So I have in the last year, I figured out what I, I've been doing, like measuring my ketones and my blood sugar, and I've been trying to figure out what's causing it. I'm still not entirely sure what is causing it, but I know that if I then eat rice, 40 grams of carbs from rice, I can get rid of that headache and then be fine for another week, two weeks at max. And then I have to kind of refeed with carbs again. And I'm not sure, I'm starting to suspect that maybe... It's something with, um, I'm not sure if this is true. Actually, I'm just thinking out loud. Mm -hmm. It might be something with my gut bacteria that okay. they release different toxins and stuff when I go zero carb and that that just builds up because I have also tried, I suspect because I've had um, nasal congestion since I was 18 and it's kind of getting slowly worse every year and I will have to use like a spray when I'm, it used to be when I was sleeping and then it turn into every you know all the time and it kind of goes up and down a bit depending on how inflamed I am but I cannot get rid of it with diet alone so I try to take high dose bor it, uh, bor borax for it and it seemed to be working you know, you know a little bit <laughs> but borax is like an antifungal antiviral anti everything so it's something that can probably take some time right but I also got like these bumps all over my skin doing that and at first I thought I'm oxalate dumping mm -hmm. and it's not a problem. And I had it for a long time. And then all of a sudden, all of it started itching. And that was really annoying. 
and I've, I didn't make the connection first, but eventually I realized, okay, it's because I started taking even, I couldn't be bothered to dilute the borax first. So I put them in capsules and just swallow them. So it's probably like the, the shock treatment that did something, killed something. And I got like a hoax reaction. So now I'm, I'm doing it. I'm trying it again. And if I do it two days, I start getting headache. If I do it one day and then have a day in between, I'm fine. And then I can take it another day. So that's, I'm not sure if it's the same headache, but that's the only connection that I can make. So anyhow, back to the diet. <laughs> I just went on a tangent that you no, asked me good. to talk a lot. So this is uh, your fault. In... <laughs> so yeah, I have to intermittently add some carbs in for okay. some reason. And I am not entirely sure why. Um, And I'm talking about 40 grams. I used okay. to use sweet potato when I thought that I was oxalate dumping but that raises my blood sugar a lot more than rice does so now i'm just okay. doing rice that, and i don't even that, like rice but... well that's funny because i i use rice a lot uh with certain clients who have the same issues as you do and even for myself oh. i've noticed that from experimenting not only in the earlier days of when i went keto back in 2010 but when i was competing in physique competition i would do some occasional refeeds and I found uh, things other than rice would just inflame the sh shit out of me. Um, but I noticed mm. that rice-based things had zero effect on that, and I felt fine. So white rice, cream of rice, rice cakes, things like that, I would use on occasion uh, as a refeed intervention and in, uh, or sometimes just small amounts around training, not only for, you know, energy uh, to go through extremely strenuous workouts when I was dieting hard, but also for the aesthetic benefit that a little bit of carbs would give to my physique as a mm. competitor with, you know, uh, you know, yeah. vascularity and separation and all these things and, and engorging the muscles with a small bit of glycogen. But I always found rice never bothered me. And I've actually got a couple of clients who have the same situation that you're describing right now. And I'm sure, so you know, when they watch this, they're going to be like, it's not just me. So that that's really refreshing. <laughs> and that, that kind of takes me to that's how I feel when you mention it. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 really neat. And, and what drives me crazy and, and maybe, you know, you can touch on this and maybe we can have some fun with this is sort of the narrow dogmatic view that some people out in the carnivore and keto space have where they make it sound so simple, like it's just a switch. You go, okay, you stop eating this and now you eat nothing but meat and salt and water and all of your problems are going to disappear. Life is going to be wonderful and it's just going to be unicorns and rainbows and butterflies and everything's going to be great. But it's not that simple. And when you work with people one-on-one -on -one every single day, both in the trenches of the gym that I own and with nearly 100 people in some capacity online, you realize that that's just not the case. So Coming back to some of your issues, do you, th you, you talked about gut bacteria and gut microbiome. Did you think that it was something that was going to subside over time? And maybe now you, you don't think that's the case. That's just the way you are. So now you have to have, you have to make some adjustments to the way you eat as an intervention, just be, to be able to live a life. Do you kind of think that that's where that's at? I'm hoping it's not. And I, I am the scientist. I like experimenting. So I right. don't think that I'm going to stop experimenting and see like sometimes I try it and like how many days can I go with zero carb? And right. I think my max is actually close to two weeks before I get a headache. So that's pretty good. Um, but obviously not if I want to be actual zero carb. And I tried to, I tried to, uh, another experiment a few months ago where I was like, okay, I'm going to do it. But this time I'm going to do it and do 80% fat and see if that makes a difference because everyone is like, fat is going to help with everything. And I did fat and iodine and my headaches went away and God knows. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to do this. <laughs> and I, I think that's when I actually had my, well, I, I think it was up to 12 or 13 days, but then here we go again. And I started to get a bit tired before that, but that might just be normal. Um, but I, 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 I don't know. It feels right. like I have more... Uh, periods where I can go slightly longer now without getting the headache. It's not like the periods are getting longer. It's just more of the long ones. <laughs> so maybe right. I'm slowly moving towards that. So the experiment continues. But, yeah. Yeah. And I don't I know think... if you ever had Sally K. Norton on. I haven't yet. No. But I know. No. Okay. She's brilliant. She's my favorite. Yeah. I'm a guest. big fan. She's big so fan, awesome. Yeah. 
and she's so nice as well. <laughs> I'm just <laughs> putting that out there. But she, um, I, I asked her about this, I think both times that I interviewed her, because she cannot do anything close to zero carb. And she thinks that the oxalates have damaged her mitochondria and that therefore she gets the fatigue, but I don't think she's getting headaches. So I'm, I'm, I've been in, interested in that for quite some time and it doesn't seem like there's anyone out there that actually knows what that is. So that's just another person who cannot do it, but she has moved closer and closer to uh, like a zero carb, I say, but going more and more low carb over the years. But, you know, with oxalates, it can take so many years before we get rid of them and heal right. that damage. And I I don't know if there is a very easy way of replacing the mitochondria <laughs> at, you know, at an older age, because it's going to be harder the older you, that you get. But sure. it seems like she's recovering a bit, although she's not quite there yet. So I, I think there's hope. Outstanding. Just need to figure it out. But meanwhile, my, my, my number one priority is to just feel good. Right. And I know that if I go zero carb, just remove those few carbs, that's when I start losing weight. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, I'm weight stable. I don't, it's, I go up and down within a kilo and a half, like three pounds. And I just stay there. <laughs> no matter right. how much, how little I eat, it doesn't matter. But if I cut the carbs, then I lose a little bit of weight. And I could probably lose a few kilos, but I don't care. I, I just want to have energy and I want to feel good. So I'm going to eat this way until I don't have to anymore. Right. Yeah. And I tell people it's, you know, you need to base a lot of this on performance and how you feel. Um, I ask my clientele mm. on a regular basis, you know, how do you feel? How are your workouts going? How is your sleep? Do you fall asleep quickly? Do you sleep soundly? Do you wake up refreshed? And depending on how people answer those questions, you know, really carries a lot of weight and how we continue on and make adjustments in their division of macros and their effective energy consumption or, or, or whatever. Um, and I yeah. found for myself, you talked about 80% fat. When I experimented with super high fat, I fell apart. I felt like absolute shit. I didn't perform well. So for me, the sweet spot is somewhere to that 60-40. When I'm about 60% fat mm. and 40% protein, I perform great. I feel great. I stay you know, weight stable. I can you know, decrease my effective energy intake slightly and lose body fat. I can bring it up if I want to go through a period of you know, uh, building, sustaining or building muscle or, or whatever. So I think everybody's kind of got their thing. That's why it's important to not just take information at face value as it's just blanket coverage, but you have to experiment oh, yeah. and keep continuing forward and finding what works best for you. And clearly you're an example of that. So back to the carnivore keto community, like I had mentioned, they just think it's, you know, they make it sound like it's just a simple switch that you, that you push a button, you push, stop doing this and do this. And yeah. then everything's going to be fantastic. But clearly that's not the case because I know that from dealing with real people every day, you know that especially from not only yourself, but dealing with people as well. So let talk about that a little bit about, you know, some of the challenges that a lot of my clients are going to be really relate to in, in terms of making that switch and maybe how you can overcome some of those carbohydrate addictions and ease the entryway into that carnivore or strict ketogenic lifestyle? Yeah, so the first thing I think people need to do is stop listening to everyone on the internet because everyone will have a different message. Right. And, uh, you know, I have had clients who been, like, like you, been doing really well on actually high protein. And then they watch something about someone talking about high fat and how that is helping them lose weight or whatever. And now they want to try that and they feel like shit. And then they ask me, like, how am I supposed to stay on this diet? I'm like, but I know that you did so well when you were eating high protein. So why are you doing this to yourself? Right. Oh, but they said hormones and losing fat and God knows. It's not working for everyone. And can I just ask you a question <laughs> in regards to that? Because you, you're doing a lot of exercise and I, I, I think a lot of women they do better in general on high fat but mm -hmm. i think that that might have to do with the muscle mass and how much you're working out and how much muscle you have to yes. actually maintain yep. is that what you see as well definitely the the people that yeah. in, in my circles the people that i work with my clientele women um the ones that yeah. are very active that are training hard they tend to tolerate the 
35 to 40 percent protein ratio very very well um but i do work yeah. with some people that are sort of metabolically broken that are just easing into light exercise or just doing a little bit of cardio and i found that especially on the outset having the fat a little higher works better for them uh generally now mm -hmm. there's outliers with all of this stuff i've had a, a couple yeah, other women that did better on even higher protein and even lower fat. And then now, as we discussed before, you know, I was dealing with a, a client uh, consultation yesterday and just by going from super strict carnivore to incorporating uh, 25 grams of carbohydrate around her training made all the difference in the world. Literally all the different, yeah. that, that slight little turn of the wrench with a, that little addition of carbohydrate around her training, it seemed to reset her thermostat and everything got rolling again. And then I have some women and men that if I throw 10 grams of carbs at them, they completely fall apart. So I do have to take it on a case by case basis. So we sort of start with an, an umbrella of bullet points. We want to obviously limit carb intake. We want to raise the effective energy from dietary fat. We want to stay very animal based, blah, blah, blah. But then once we set you know, those certain bullet point parameters, then it's about turning the knobs on each individual and finding out what works. Yes. And I've often said, I'm not going to be that guy that thinks he's got some revolutionary new carnivore ish technology that's going to alleviate everybody's problems. And I'm just some, you know, you know, outlier, you know, genius. I would yeah. rather have less followers, less likes, less clicks. I don't give a shit if I'm going to be truthful with you. If I yeah. think whatever's working for you is what I want you to do, even if it deviates from the doctrine out there or the gospel of carnivore or whatever you want to call it, you know, I'm that's where we're going to go. So when I'm dealing with a person and I've had women almost like were embarrassed or felt guilty to tell me um, Rob, I, I tried a little bit of this and I, and I felt really good and, and it's going better. Is that okay? I'm like, what do you mean? Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Of course that's okay. <laughs> of course. You know, do that. Let's keep down that road and let's evaluate how you do on that for the next four to six weeks. And then if it's this, if you're just crushing it, then we're going to continue down that path. If that tends to level off or maybe something detrimental starts to creep in, then we'll address that as it comes and then make those adjustments on the fly. It's it's a constantly evolving process. And it sounds yes. like that's exactly what you do. And that's so refreshing because it's not just my way or the highway dogma. It's, uh, hey, whatever works is what we're going to do. And, you know, the experts be damned. So that's what I really like about what you're talking about here. So, so. Let, let's get down to, to what uh, there's people out there in this evidence-based community. And, you know, some of them are fantastic, but some of them just make me want to claw my eyeballs out because it's all about the study, the study, the study, the study. And then you get into this war of studies and some of the research is really shitty and, you know, it's, it just will drive you insane. But uh, it, I cannot tell you how many times I've run across one of these clowns that says, carbohydrate and sugar is not addictive. That's not, you know, it, that's not a thing. It's just about reduce your calories, calories in, calories out, horse shit, horse shit, horse shit. And people see this stuff and then they wonder what's wrong with their wiring. So mm. I, sugar addiction is a thing from a physiological level and from a mental level. I mean, talk about that because I know that that's what everybody wants to hear. Why is that getting rid of the carbohydrates, getting off sugar so damn hard, one, and two, what do we do about that? I mean, how do we make that a little, how do we make this journey a little easier on us? Because we know that carnivore and keto feels great. We know that it's working. We know that's ancestral. We know that, you know, our hunter gatherers thrived on this. In this temptation culture of hyper palatable foods, how do we fight this battle? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's what I do. And it's not a quick process. It's something that you have to take your time with because it's biology. We have brains that have evolved in a certain way and they have evolved to seek out anything that is pleasurable, yes. which is supposed to be all the foods. 
But the problem with carbohydrates is that they are a bit more pleasurable than other foods. A bit? And you're, you're being generous. They, you know, yeah. <laughs> well, if we're talking like wild apples, they probably, they have like, they, yeah. they have yeah. a little bit of sugar, but they're also very tart. So if we go back like to evolution, we didn't have a lot of super sweet stuff. And when we found some berries, which probably was the sweetest stuff at the time, you know, berries have maybe somewhere between six and 12 grams maybe of carbs per 100 grams. So even if you found them, you wouldn't like flood your system with glucose or fructose for that matter. You would just eat whatever you found probably. You would feel really, really good doing it because that's what's happening. And when we feel really good about it, it's like the brain is telling you, it goes into like hyper learning mode. So you will remember everything about that moment. You would remember where you were, how you went there, where that freaking berry bush is, at what level it is. Is it high? Is it low? You know, you would remember all the details. And you can probably relate to this. If you ever bought, I don't know, a ladle <laughs> in the supermarket, you're not going to remember where you bought, found it. But if you found this super good chocolate, you're going to know exactly where it was. Oh, it was on that shelf there. Aisle six, actually. No question. Th third shelf. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's just learning very, very quickly. So you are going to get hooked pretty much the first time you have carbs. It's going right. to tell you, this is a good thing. We want more carbs. And as a child, it's just going to be, obviously, the type of food that your parents or whoever the adult is giving you. You're going to know that I want that. So the next time, if you're watching a kid, their eyes are going to be like, ooh, yeah, yeah, there's that thing that I had once. I have and four kids. I, I know that look. I know that look. I have four kids and a grandson. <laughs> that, that look is burned in my brain. <laughs> yeah, it's awful. Well, yeah. it's kind of funny, but it's awful that it's happening. Yeah. And what is happening in the brain is that when you consume it, there are several neurotransmitters, but the largest one that I always talk about is the dopamine mm -hmm. and dopamine is getting released and that makes you feel pleasure so the problem with any type of processed carbs or even like modern fruits because they're very high in sugar this is not a natural thing right <laughs> even though they look like natural things they are not because they've been selected for and chosen because of the high sugar content so i i wouldn't say that i'm addicted to fruit or ever was because I always wanted the real like the real high so going to fruit felt like oh, this is such a bad substitute and I could probably right. eat fruit all day but it would never satisfy me because I would never get as much dopamine as I would eating chocolate or ice cream or something right but let's say we didn't have the processed food you would probably be able to get quite addicted to fruit and I believe there are people that are addicted to fruit as well but what happens is you get a lot, a, a chunk of dopamine. Let's say for a steak, out of on a scale from one to ten, you might get a dopamine release of four. Mm -hmm. So it's pleasurable to eat, but it's nothing sensational. And if you eat ice cream, you might get up to an eight, let's say. So if we were, let's say it's just like for every time you eat ice cream, you get eight hundred molecules of dopamine. <laughs> this is not true. There's a lot more. But, right. And we have 400 receptors. They're going to be 100% saturated. So the first time you have this ice cream, you're going to be like, holy smokes, this is good. <laughs> and your body is going to be like, hmm, this, we don't, you know, we have too many receptors. We don't need to feel this high. So it's going to start down regulating receptors. So the next time you have the ice cream, you're still going to get 800 molecules of dopamine. But now you might just have 370 receptors. So okay. you're not going to get the same high. And then you're going to be unsatisfied because you didn't get to the level where you were the previous time. And this is what we call tolerance, where we start building up tolerance that we just want more and more and more. So this it doesn't happen exactly like that from the first and second time that you have it, but to some degree it probably does. So over time, you're just going to need more and more and more because you're never going to be satisfied because you're always chasing the first high that you had. So this is how the brain actually works. But if you are eating, let's say, fruit, um, let's say berries, because they are, they are probably the most natural <laughs> vegetable that or you know plant matter that we are eating, they might give you a six. 
And maybe six is actually a normal thing. Like your brain expects that to be very high, but not too high. It's not like, oh, we have too many. We don't need this much. And you're not going to get that tolerance building up because you're not over overflooding your brain with dopamine. And you might actually be safe and not be able to be addicted to those carbs. Interesting. But the thing is that even if, I mean, we have all these tribes. Some tribes are just like proper meat and milk eaters maybe. And some other tribes, they actually do incorporate a lot of tubers or whatever. They, I don't believe that they are addicted to the carbs because they're not... Right overeating right and the sweetness isn't there so they don't get that high dopamine release maybe or maybe not the blood sugars are perfect or not they're probably pretty good i suspect if they're not eating a lot of processed stuff and then we could be safe but they probably don't walk around craving these tubers right it's just like that's just the diet and there is no like emotional connection to it so that's the second part is like when you go on a carnivore diet, you are able to fix your physiology that you have effed up by eating a lot of sugar. And all of a sudden those cravings go away. So that's why it's easy to not eat the carbs. And especially when you're motivated to go on that diet in the first few days, you're like, yeah, this is really good. I feel mm -hmm. so good. And then you're like, oh, this is getting a bit boring. Immediately your brain is like, wow, carbs are good. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. If you're bored, we know how to fix that. And that's an emotional eating response. Right. Boredom is like feeling bored is a feeling, that's an emotion. And I never thought that I was an emotional eater, but I always eat to procrastinate or when I'm bored. <laughs> Those are my big sure, things. Yeah, absolutely. That's when I want to go and check the cupboard. I'm like, oh, I can't be bothered. To oh, do okay, this. so that so that's interesting. <laughs> Well, number one, it's that's got me thinking all kinds of things. So the physiological <laughs> addiction, clearly, we know this, will subside over time by not being on that mm. glucose roller coaster. But then you talk about, yeah. you know, the 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 area with being addicted to, you know, the boredom and all these things, the emotional eating, that's mm -hmm. you know, that ends up being the problem that remains and it becomes a major obstacle to people. So number one. Yeah. I I want to I want to talk about how we can alleviate that steps to take, but yeah. I also have a question for you. You talked about the blueberries, and then you've got a sweet potato, and that's not going to get the same response in the brain. Da da da. Do you think it's at an even greater level, or or one of the biggest issues is is the combination of hyperpalatable foods, or the combination of fat and sugar to create a hyperpalatable food? Yeah. Because in nature fat and sugar together doesn't really exist very commonly. It's not a common thing to stumble upon. So when you talked yeah. about ice cream, you talked about chocolate, you know, if you think about cakes and pies, you have this uh, elevation of this massive amount of sugar, this massive influx of fat together to create this super hyper palatable mm -hmm. food. And that seems to yeah. be, I think the thing that really got us into this massive dilemma to begin with. So we're, does that obviously? I, I think I've. I think it's clear that it does. But sh clearly, those hyperpalatable combinations are going to be the biggest issue. Correct. For most people, absolutely. Um, I mean, just imagine a cheesecake. It has dairy. Um, if your viewers don't know it, but in casein can turn into casein morphine, and that's why dairy can be a bit addictive as well mm -hmm. on its own, even if it's not sweet. So we have dairy, we have high fat, we have sugar. It's like the perfect addictive food. It's, it's the perfect storm. Like the it's the perfect storm. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Absolutely. so that, that's Personally, clear. Personally, I'm a sugar addict. Okay. I could eat brown sugar with a spoon. I didn't need <laughs> the fat. It was just sugar. That's what I crave. Wow. So, See, I, but I'm for a... most people, I think it's more cakes and stuff. Yeah, I, I, I'm I'm not like a like a gummy bear candy sugar alone kind of a person. The only mm -hmm. time that I get like drawn to something to even want to consider, you know, having a dietary transgression would be something like that hyper palatable combination, that salty sweet or that fat, you know, savory sweet mm -hmm. and cakey things like, you know, brownies, something that's gooey sweet, but also has that, yes. that substantial element to it. Or 
I always when people Talk ask my me, language. <laughs> yeah, when people ask me what what's the thing that my I'm most likely to cave with, and here's a good example. When I was competing, obviously, when you're at that level, the level of compliance has to be nearly a hundred percent to the point of yeah. ridiculous, almost unnatural. Yeah. And then when the competition's over, the question everybody asks me is, "What do you want to eat after you've been dieting to the point of near starvation for twelve weeks?" And I say, "Breakfast carbs." That's what I always say. So for me, it's if I could have anything five minutes after I walk off stage, it was a giant stack of pancakes, Belgian waffles, you know, that sort of a thing. So, or, you know, any sort of a breakfasty like sweet roll or bun or sticky buns or all these things. That was the thing that always got me that hyper palatable combination of cakey fat and sugar. So I totally get that. Um, that, that was all my thing. But uh, so that's where I have to be careful is when those things cross my path. And I just have to say no. And ironically, my 15 year old daughter you know, loves to bake. She's very artistic and has found baking to be her, her artistic outlet. So it's like a, a very cool trick God has played on me. But uh, so there's always like flour and dough flying in the kitchen, you know, at, at any at any given moment in my house. So I have to fight that battle on a regular basis. God bless her. I love you, sweetie. Keep baking. It's okay. But uh, so, but yeah, so yeah, I'll, clearly uh, for most people that I've found that hyper palatable combination of the two that we're tem tempted with in this culture now, and the food manufacturers know that it's tempting, that that's where they're making their money, the sugar industry, the, yeah. you know, big food. But so anyway, back to like the big question with that emotional eating, that, that addictive quality for the people watching this that are like on the edge of their seat now wondering what the frick do I do? What do you do? Right. So the first step is just building a little bit of awareness because some people are not even aware of what they're doing. It's like there was a packet of Oreos here. Now it's empty and clearly I've eaten it, but I don't <laughs> know how that happened. <laughs> I mean, it's happened to most people. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. So it, Exactly. So if we don't even know that we're eating it, like, well, we kind of like, we, I'm just going to have two and then it's empty. And you're like, oh, shit. Then we need to start with just building awareness. So I had like what I'm teaching is like a several step process. And it's literally if you go on YouTube, you will find some you can go and search for the habit loop. I teach an extra step in there. But literally what's happening is that first you have a trigger. So we want to identify the trigger. And that can just be seeing the cookies or smelling something, having a memory. Someone says something, someone is eating something. You hear a sound, anything that you can just relate to eating, whatever. Or time of the day is kind of common. Like it's afternoon, so I should have whatever. So we start with identifying the triggers. And when you're triggered, this is not included in the normal habit loops, but I include it because it's super important. You will have a thought. And it's usually very, very innocent. It would just be like, hmm, it would be nice with some chocolate or something. Like, super silly. We wouldn't think that just thinking that will get us to go and eat chocolate, but it actually does. So when you're thinking that, you will have a physiological response in your body, with, <clears throat> which is the craving. And cravings don't feel good. <laughs> That's what cravings do. They are not meant to feel good. They are meant to get you off your ass and go and find food. So that's what they're doing. And you're going to feel like, I need to go and get it. But actually, you do not have to go and get it. All it is, is a sensation in your body. That's all it is. So we work with that part. Because if you are okay with feeling uncomfortable emotions, there is no reason for you to go and eat anything. So that's kind of the key step that we um, always attack. We work on the thoughts as well. And we're trying to get better thoughts that are not even triggering. But yeah. If you just have the skill of being able to allow yourself to have negative emotions without responding with, by eating to them, then you're good. So that's like the backup plan that makes you bulletproof. So what you do is just, you just observe what is happening. So for me, a craving is I have tension in my jaw and then I start like salivating. I'm, <laughs> I'm a typical Tavlov's dog. <laughs> right. But I also feel the tension the whole way down where the food would go. And it's kind of tense and it's buzzing a little bit. And if I just focus on that rather than what I want to go eat or whatever, and the only thing that I want to do is observe what's happening. So I can put my scientist hat on. I want to see what is happening. And that's it. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
when I don't have an agenda with it, other than just feeling what's going on in my body, the craving will go away. And But this is the key step that can take a bit of time to learn. But the more times you're practicing, the quicker you will get there. So I have clients who have got there in, you know, two, three weeks because they have a lot of cravings and they make the commitment to sit with those cravings and practice this. And then they get there quicker. And then I have clients that are still working on it after four months. But sure you will see a gradual increase in how, how easy it becomes for them to do it. It's just that they don't have many cravings. So if you just have one craving per day, it's going to take you a little bit longer than someone who has 15, 20, because some of us do. Right. <laughs> and then right. you can get that pretty quickly. Absolutely. But it's also about allowing the craving to be there and not resisting it and using willpower. So those are, that's why I say that focus on just having it accept having it and not trying to fix it in any way we're just observing it's a science experiment when you wish that it would go away or you you're trying to distract yourself with something else you're not allowing yourself to practice this behavior and you're not going to get the benefit from it so that's kind of the key point and then this will create a new habit loop in your head so this is just a new neural pathway where you kind of going you have your trigger you have a thought and then rather than going down a normal path, you just go down a new path. And every time you practice this, that neural pathway will get stronger and it will be easy for you to do it. And eventually you're going to do it without thinking about it. And that's when it's hard for my clients to continue practicing because all of a sudden they don't have any cravings because it automatically goes there unless they have a very specific, very strong craving, maybe in a new situation or something that they haven't been exposed to for a while. Interesting. So that's literally how you do it. It's not hard to do. It's just about making the commitment to continue doing it, even when it feels like it's not working in the beginning. So it's an exercise, like everything. I mean, it's yeah. it's repetition is yeah. the mother of skill kind of a thing, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, makes sense. Um, now, I here... have a group program now. And oh, I, sweet. every single one who goes through that, the goal is to have 100 allowed cravings, because I know once they've had 100 allowed cravings, they're going to be there. Interesting. And maybe not 100% on autopilot for everyone, but so far, pretty much everyone is there. And there might be some little, yeah, I have a client the other day and she's like, yeah, I had some cough syrup and it wasn't even, there wasn't even any sugar in, but I just got massive cravings from that. But she knew how to do it. So she just had to re-engage her uh, prefrontal cortex, the part of the brain that is conscious wow. and just do the exercise again. And then she was fine. So she didn't fall off the wagon, but she was surprised at how the cravings came back. So sometimes there are outside forces that create cravings. I have cravings whenever, if I sleep less than five hours, I will have almost guaranteed have cravings. Me too. Or Me too. the day before my period starts, I'm definitely having cravings. So on those days, I know what the cause is. And I'm like, okay, today is the day I'm just going to eat anything, like any anything of the foods that I normally eat. So I'm just... right. I, if I have a lot of cravings all day, I'm, like, ah, I'm just going to eat because I know I'm hungry as well. <laughs> so, right. and, and that's just, interesting. Just choose how you want to deal with it. And because you're yeah. hungry, when when like myself, competing when I had those goals, and of course having mm -hmm. a goal keeps you driven and focused because there's an there's an end, and you want you know. In my case, yeah. it was going to be standing on stage in front of a thousand people in my underwear, being judged. <laughs> so that was strong motivation to stay on point. But the thing yeah. is, is, you know, the people that I deal with, many come into this relate this coaching relationship with a nearly lifelong dieters mentality. And mm -hmm. they're so driven to stay in this steep caloric deficit because that's what's been hammered in their heads their whole life. And they're also trying to achieve a certain social standard with what we're inundated with on social media and all these, you know, models and, you know, fitness people who give you the illusion that they look this way year round and everybody's perfect. And this is the standard, especially for young women. So we get caught in this dieting mentality. So one of the things I love about the carnivore diet or, or versions of the carnivore diet is I drill in my client's head that it's time to escape that dieting mentality, that starvation, deprivation, yes. and misery cycle that you've been in and nourish yourself, eat food and eat you know, get to, to, to where your body's own satiety signals are working properly and you, you develop a relationship with food that it is true nourishment. And do you think it's a lot harder for people who stay in this, 
dieting, this long-term deficit dieting mentality that it's going to be twice as hard for them? Because that's what I've found. Yeah, I do have some clients that come to me with that. And um, the problem with that is that it's the all or nothing thinking mm -hmm. that they they cannot focus on just allowing themselves to feel because they're so focused on not eating the carbs by the end of it. And sometimes that, that process takes weeks to get rid of them focusing on the outcome because when you learn the process, you're going to get the outcome. You don't have to focus on that. But when you're just focusing on that, you forget to just be the scientist and observe what's happening and then you're not learning. So then you keep struggling and you keep trying to white knuckle it and use willpower and it's never going to work. So I, I yeah, I do think that that's going to make it a lot harder. But if we think about it, this is also just a neural pathway. It's a thought that they have thought so many times that some you know, media and everything has hammered into their brains. So what I would do if I was someone who, and you obviously need to want to change this thinking, is just find all the evidence to the contrary, write a list. So every time you think I shouldn't be eating these calories, give equal airtime to something of the opposite list. Well, maybe I should because whatever your reason is, so that we have some balance to start with and not being so black and white so that we can see both sides to the story. Interesting. Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, the, the, one of the biggest struggles for me dealing with clientele is getting them off of the diet mentality that, that it's, it's, mm. it's about restriction. It's about deprivation. And that's one of the hardest battles I fight. And then I'll even take somebody that has a very, you know, serious goal in mind, whether it's competition or a family reunion or a wedding, or just look great on the beach this summer. And we do lower that effective energy you know, from food to a degree where we do, we find that they're in a bit of a deficit, a safe, effective deficit that gets them to do in a safe, effective body fat reduction and change their body composition. But then they fall into the trap of more is better and more is better. So obviously if this amount of food is, I'm getting some results, then I should go even less and then I should go even less. And then as we know, what happens is, is then they start to become hormonally broken and then things shut down and the body has its own series of defense mechanisms that then you know, cease the process of, um, I went through that myself. I, I you know, I made a, a terrible mistake at one point in my competition career when I was trying to get, I got, I went into a competition literally somewhere in the neighborhood of 4.5 to 5% body fat, which is not healthy clearly, but I was trying to achieve a victory on stage in a physique competition. So I did that and I won. I won my class three times and did very, very well, qualified to go to nationals. And then I, the guy that knows better, fell into that mental trap of, well, if I got this good eating this small amount of you know matter, yeah. then if I go even deeper, I can get even leaner and really freak people out on stage. And what happened was, is I got to a point, and I tell this story, I got to a point where I was down a 215 pound man, primarily muscle. I was eating 1100 calories and couldn't drop an ounce over weeks. Wow. Nothing happened. And I got so physically broken that I was having dizzy spells. Um, I was nauseous a lot of the times and my physiological, my physiology, my physiology changed so much, especially in my brain that I remember consuming one teaspoon of almond butter. And when I put that almond butter in my mouth, it tasted like the most decadent, sinful, amazing thing I'd ever eaten in my life. And that was my body telling me, you're starving, you're broken, your body is shutting down, eat something. I don't care if it's fucking dirt. I'm, we're going to make you think it tastes amazing because we need to save you. You're dying. And, I re and I'm, I'm being a little dramatic, but not really, because that's how deep I went. And now my yeah. you know goals have changed. Now I'm just trying to be very, very healthy and well nourished. And it's about, you know, being the best I can be in all aspects. But you know, people get into this hole of less is more and diet and diet and diet, restrict, deprived, dis restrict, deprived. And that's how I'm going to get the six-packer. That's how I'm going to get the bang and beach body. 
And then all they're doing is taking one step forward and five steps backward, and then they find themselves completely broken. And it's so hard to pull out of that once you get there. So you know, that's yeah. a mentality that I wish I had the magic solution to get people to understand, listen, Jessica, just eat something. You're going to be okay as long as you choose something off of this food list. Eat, right? I mean, yeah. how do we get people to get out of that obsessed diet mentality and make them understand that that you know food can be medicine? Yeah, so that's a very interesting question. I think if it comes to people who are actually competing, it, it's rough because you're competing because you want to win. Correct. And if, as you said, it's like when I got to four or five percent, I won all of it. Right. So, and, and I think it's a competition. Know, it's Everybody really thinks it's a competition. They think life is a competition. Getting lean, <laughs> achieving yeah. the standard that I see on television and in movies and in magazines and on social media, that that, that that's the competition of life and being able to be, you know, adequate and accepted and, and being uh, that's that's what the world expects of me and we they poor young women are getting caught in that and it's a battle that i fight to tr try to convince them that they have to nourish themselves and there is a way out you just don't eat the shit you eat the good foods but you need to eat adequate amounts in order to heal yourself from within and and once i can get people to go through six eight twelve weeks of that then everything changes and they're a completely human being and they're lean and they're fit and they're functional and mm -hmm. they're beautiful and, you know, everything improves, but getting them to pull themselves out of that deep deficit that's I've had clients that have come to me that have admitted that they've been on a super calorically reduced diet for years, years, and they're completely broken. And then you see their blood work and you're like, Oh my God. And you can wave blood work in front of their faces and they still don't care. It's about, get the body, yeah. get the body, get the body. So that's the battle that I fight. So having somebody, you know, like yourself, who's dealt with these emotional issues, you know, that that's, that's critical stuff. So, you know, having this insight from you is invaluable. Yeah, I think, I mean, if, if it was a client, it's really hard to tell like what you can do on your own, because I think it's, we always have these obsessive thoughts and you need to start changing those thought patterns. And that's kind of hard to do on your own. So getting a coach of some kind is probably a really good idea. Someone who can actually see what is happening and then help you change the way that you're thinking about it. But something that people can do on their own, there is a, an exercise. If you go to YouTube and you uh, search for seven levels deep exercise, you will find an exercise called seven levels deep. So what it is, it's like, it's asking you, okay, why is it important to you to lose body fat or whatever it is that you want to do, whatever the goal is? And you answer that question and maybe it's like, because I want to win the competition. Okay, why is that important to you? Because it would make me feel like I have accomplished something. Okay, why is it important to you to feel like you have accomplished something? And you just keep going and going. And when you get to like level four or five, it should go from like being something that you answer with your head to something that you're actually emotionally connected to. And it can be a little bit tricky the first time you do it, maybe, because some people just want to spin up here and they just find more and more reasons like, yeah, well, it would be nice. I would be a better person, whatever. But when you can go down there, you find a true reason for why you want to do it. So for me, every time I do this, something that I am attracted to is being free to be me and be accepted for being the true person like being my true authentic self and most people get to some sort of flavor of that and if I was just being me and being accepted for who I am and people were just like okay either we like you or we don't like you mm -hmm. <laughs> and I could just truly be just happy that I am being me then I don't care about what other people think anymore so if you can find out what your true reason for wanting to do pretty much anything in life is then maybe that will start shift and you will notice that you know being the skinniest is not what's important here what's actually important is that I am being able to like be me and be recognized for who I am or what I have accomplished or whatever so 
then we can maybe start shifting the thinking from there. So that that's something that people can do on their own and just figure that out and see what's important. Because when you're on your deathbed, are you going to think about, oh, I only got down to 6% body yeah. fat? Or are you going to miss thinking like, oh, well, I wish that I had done all of these things because that would have made me feel so much better, which is usually what people wish for on their deathbed when they haven't done things that 100 when they've been scared of doing things like i sh probably should have like left that relationship earlier or yep. i shouldn't have stayed in that job uh, or you know i'm why did i say no to this thing just because i was a bit afraid those are the kind of things that matter and that's where you want to go because that's what gonna help you live your life the way that you actually do want to live your life not just being stuck in some sort of addiction or another because one thing to just eat as little as possible is sort of, it's the same kind of thinking. It gives you a high every time you're like, yes, I didn't go over on my calories. It will give right. you a dopamine hit every time of the day. So it's even narrowed down to that little success that registers mm. in our brains of that accomplishment of not you know, overeating that day or that minute or that hour. So it, it comes yeah. at you from so many sides. It sounds like you're in a constant war. So it's yeah. uh it's about you know battles are won in the brain it's about being more intelligent not necessarily being the strongest or having the biggest guns. Yeah. So I think what you're saying really is a testimony to that. So that's very very important. So so that takes us to the $64,000 question knowing what you know about carb addiction, food addiction and all of these things that go with that why do you believe that a carnivore diet or ketogenic diet is sort of the apex of human nutrition. And why do you think once people do uncover some of these addictions and alleviate that, that they should land on some version of that style of diet? Do you want to say, I, I, I think it's like, we know that we have evolved eating this and we know that I mean, I know, like but someone diet. else is yeah. like, be watching this is like, why should I do this? It makes so much sense, but I want to, I want to pull the trigger on carnivore. Tell me to do it. So tell them to do it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, as I say, we have evolved eating this way. So our bodies and our brains are, they are made to eat this way and function best when we are eating this way. Yep. And I think that someone who, let's say, you're growing up and you're eating mostly this way. I think you can get away with having some berries and fruit and whatever. Sure. I think you're going to be perfectly healthy because we all have uh, a capacity to take on an amount of physical abuse in the terms of the diets that we are eating. But for most of us, we have abused our bodies with crap food for many, many years. And I don't think that it's going to work for you to just eat a balanced diet. I hate yeah, that word. <laughs> I hate that word. <laughs> <laughs> because it's not balanced. Right. What's balanced is that you're eating what, like a species appropriate diet. And that's actually a word that I've stolen from when I started raw feeding my dogs when I got my dogs, because I researched that a lot. And I was like, this is a species appropriate diet. And now I use it for human nutrition as well. Yes. So yes. I just literally think that we, we're made to eat this way. And that's when we're going to function the best. And that's the reason why I keep trying to move towards carnivore because I don't believe that physiologically I should need rice or blueberries or probably not even yogurt. And I, it would be nice to just eat that way. And it's kind of really simple and easy to do as well. And I like it. And I have had a lot of drama about it because I like cooking. And as your daughter, I love yeah. baking. But I stopped baking many years ago because I can't bake and just throw it away. So right. <laughs> it's like, choose <laughs> what right. I'm going to do with it. Um, so if if you want to be healthy, if you want to give your body like the maximum amount of nutrients that are bio, what's the word? Bioabsorbable. Yeah, bioavailable. <laughs> bioavailable yeah. is the mm -hmm. word. <laughs> I was like, what is the word? <laughs> then eating as close to a carnivore diet as possible is probably the best thing for anyone to do. hundred percent, hundred percent. And, and, you know, back to the whole addiction part. I mean, I, I know it sounds simple or too simplistic, but I'll often say to my clients just to, to make them understand, listen, if I eat a ribeye steak 10 minutes later, I don't want another one. I feel very well, well nourished. I feel, you know, pleased. I'm content. Uh, I'm not hungry. There's no more satiety signals. 
But if I eat a slice of pizza, then I'm oh, going to go yeah. eat another one in, in five <laughs> minutes and then another one. And then I'm going to sneak out there. And then I fall into the trap of if nobody sees me eat it, then it really didn't happen. And then I even oh, you know, yes. feel better about that. And you know how that works. So, you know, the, the carnivore diet, I, I just, I feel so nourished and alive mm -hmm. moments after I consume these foods and my mental acuity is just outstanding. And from a guy who's been training super intensely for 30 years, I'm performing phenomenally, uh, you know, at 54 years old. Yeah. I, you know, I feel like, I mean, statistically, I'm probably in the top 2%. And that's not to like beat my chest and brag. That's almost like, that's a sad thing for me to say that more people should be, you know, we should broaden that statistic a little bit. You know, people don't have to be falling apart, diseased and broken in their 40s, 50s, 60s, or even beyond that. And a simple shift yeah. into, like like you said, that species appropriate diet, lift some things, walk around a little bit, get some sunlight on your skin, get adequate sleep, don't absorb environmental toxins. It, that list is not complicated, but it's just the follow through <laughs> and living in this temptation culture yeah. that we live in that makes it so dif difficult. It's, it's, it's not the ideology. It's not the prescription. It's actually following through. And that's why people like you doing what you do, working with these people is so important. So, you know, I'm going to tell mm -hmm. my listeners to go to your channel and start burning through your videos. And this video is going to be one that I'm going to recommend clients keep going back to when they have those moments and they're having those difficulties. And that's, this is going to be a very, very important thing. So now here's something else I want to cover before. I don't want to keep you too long, but I definitely wanted to cover this. Yeah. One of these little like commandments that I give to my clients um, <laughs> over the years has been, if the first thing that you do when you go keto or carnivore is start look looking for keto versions of the shit that got you into this mess in the first place, then you're going to fail. You know what I'm talking about? Like the keto cheesecake, the keto brownies, the, the keto pizza, all this horse shit. Mm -hmm. It's just setting everybody up for massive failure. And I know me, you know, my wife made me some keto brownies one time and they absolutely sucked. And all that did was make me want to yeah. go buy real freaking brownies. So if I just abstain altogether, I feel amazing. I don't crave. And the, the uh, number of cravings that come across my path are very, very few and far between. So artificial sweeteners is a hot debate in this community mm. that that we're so pleased to be a part of. Um, hey. That's become almost like damn vegans and they're bickering back and forth. But uh, yeah. do yeah. artificial sweeteners... Are they detrimental? Do they raise insulin? Do they like like push cravings? Talk to me about that because I know this is going to be another hot button topic that my listeners are going to want to know. Yeah. Okay. Can I just say one thing first that I was thinking about when you were talking? One thing that the carnivore diet does to cravings is that it reduces inflammation in your brain. So it's e easy for you to just stay focused on what you actually want to do and not go crazy. Yeah. So that's another thing as well. So well some people talk that. about that inflammatory response that goes all the way yeah. to, the, to the brain. Yeah. Because people always think, oh, it's nerves. my joints. He's talking about joints and mm -hmm. my knees feel better and my hips feel better, but it goes <laughs> far deeper than that. And I'm glad you brought that up. It goes all the way to here, which is the most important. Yeah. Absolutely. So when it comes to artificial sweetness, I mean, some of them are just like really, really bad and we want to stay away from them, like aspartame and that sort of thing. I do two sweeteners myself. I do stevia. I actually, I have monk fruit as well. I don't use it a lot, but I have stevia, I have monk fruit and I have erythritol at home. Mm -hmm. And the only time I actually use them is in my morning egg coffee. And I drink that because... I'm one of these people, I'm struggling to eat a lot of protein. So I'm mm -hmm. having five eggs for breakfast in my coffee. And it's very easy for me to do. And I cannot have coffee without sweetener in. It doesn't create any cravings for me. And I think because I have eggs and a lot of butter in there, I'm, it probably doesn't do anything. But let's say if I had black coffee with sweetener, I would probably have a different response. Several... I mean, different people, keep this in mind as well, different people react differently to sweetener. So this sure. doesn't apply to everyone. But I did an experiment on myself a few years ago and I was fasted for 16 hours and then I had an amount of cream 
just cream, whipped cream, and I just ate it. I don't like that, but I did it. And I measured my blood sugar, and it kind of went up a little bit. Then the next day, I did the same thing, and I put stevia in, and I got a slight blip, and then down to baseline. So what that is telling me is that I definitely have an insulin response because it brought my blood sugar down to baseline very quickly. Mm -hmm. So if I'm not consuming anything, if I just have black coffee with the stevia, for example, coffee is probably the wrong thing because it will increase your um, uh, adrenaline, etc., and release mm -hmm. some sugar. But if I had <laughs> stevia water, because if you buy a, a drink, you might have it sweetened with stevia and there are no calories in there. Right. If you drink that, for example, your blood sugar might drop and make you very hungry and start craving stuff. So that could be the danger. And what many people find as well is by keeping the sweet taste in your diet, they will keep the cravings alive much more. Right. I don't find that that is the case for me, but a lot of people do. I, I have clients so, that tell me if they drink like a, a Diet Coke or, or something like that, then it immediately... It's uh, sort of kicks off their craving cycle again, and they just feel different, mm. and their their brain reacts differently, and then they start thinking about the foods that they shouldn't have, and then when they cease those things altogether, they find that things level off and things get a lot better. So there's got to be something going on there. Yeah, I, I mean, sweet taste will get you to release insulin straight sure. away, even if you just take it in your mouth and you spit it out, or sometimes even thinking about it. <laughs> We'll do it. I mean, right. we are complicated creatures. It's just a set of chemical things that are happening in your body. 100%, so different absolutely. people are gonna. I don't understand these evidence-based people that literally have a hundred thousand subscribers coming on saying that artificial sweeteners are benign. There's no studies that support that they're dangerous. They don't, you know, raise insulin. They don't spike blood sugar. They're totally safe. Have all you want. Blah blah blah. And I just. I just want to beat my head against the wall when I watch these things. It's just creating such a, a shitty environment out there of misinformation. And people, like you talked about earlier, they're listening to this guru and that guru and this person and that person. And it's like, I don't know where to turn. And they keep, then it turns into, you know, guru of the month. And then I've got to do this plan and that <laughs> plan. Find somebody you trust, somebody, find somebody who's shooting you straight, do their thing, stay consistent. If it starts working for you, stay there. Or, or, you know, or just take yes. that information that you've uh, acquired and then apply it to yourself and be your own experiment. But uh, these people out and there- try in this... it for a longer period of time. Exactly. Yeah. They, they Not jump a week programs. of each thing. <laughs> it's insane. I mean, when, when I get a client, I don't care if they're lean and fit already or if they're morbidly obese, hormonally broken, whatever. The first question that usually always comes out of their mouth is, how long is this going to take? How long is it going to be before I'm whatever? My standard reply, regardless of who I'm talking to, is I always say a year. And the people who are already very fit are like, what are you talking about a year? I'm like, listen, we're making a complete wholesale change. We're, we're building this very complex blueprint and we're laying this very complex groundwork on taking you to achieve your very best genetic potential. And that doesn't always mean aesthetically. That could mean internally. There are so many different uh, circuit boards in play here and, and switches we have to flip to get you to the point where you're at your genetic potential. And that's going to take mm -hmm. some time. So even if it takes six months, even if it takes eight months to have that mindset that you're giving yourself a minimum of one year, that's still a damn good deal. Because I tell people, if you handed me a yeah. dollar and then I said, come back in one year and I'm going to hand you a million back, you'd say that was a phenomenal investment. Yet I can tell somebody, no matter how broken you are, no matter how in disrepair you may be internally or whatever, give me a year and you can make giant strides to achieving your greatest genetic potential at any age. To me, that still sounds like a really, really good investment and a damn good deal. But because once again, of yeah. the culture we're in, it's so quick fix and everything is immediate and you, it's all about pleasure and, and easy that if it's anything less than 90 days, screw you, pal, I'm going to the next guy. So it's so frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. And how long does so, it take generally? For, someone say. How long does it take Sorry, generally your on. clients to break some of those emotional addictions that I think can be probably even more powerful than the physiological addictions? how long is a piece of string <laughs> exactly. some people 
<laughs> I was waiting for that. They just want to be stuck in the past. Yeah. yeah. They want to be stuck in the past because it's comfortable. We Then we have something to blame. I've always done it this way. And then we don't have to kind of face reality that we are actually choosing to continue doing it. And when people are doing that, it takes a lot longer because the brain is so used to doing that, that every time we kind of take a step forward, it's like, yeah, but we're just this person who doesn't do this kind of shit. We, right. we always fall off again. So that's that can take months. But as I said, I've, I've had clients who just, they just, they like my favorite clients in a way because they just do everything that I say and then they're there in two, three weeks. And I'm like, holy shit, I couldn't have done that. I know that. Right. right. <laughs> so I'm super impressed with those people. <laughs> and they just, they take notes, they do everything that I say and they just go at it as if it was their job and they get the results very quickly. Whereas when you're stuck in this victim mentality for, yeah, I've always done that and I had a bad childhood or whatever. Are you going to sit there and feel sorry for yourself or are you going to do the work? They're like, the, it yeah, the better vic- to feel sorry for myself. Exactly. That victim mentality is is prevalent in our society and our culture right now. And it's a sad thing. Oh, and God, yes. Some people just need to, they, they need a <laughs> kick in the ass. And uh, okay, so now I know we can have, an, we can do another interview down the road and we can talk <laughs> about the culture uh, of laziness yeah. and quick fix and how mind numbing that can be. For people that actually are yeah. adult, you know, adult babysitters like we are and have to deal with people. Yeah, mm-hmm. Like you said, I've got I got people that just hit the ground running, go all out 100 percent. They take it very seriously and they absolutely yeah. crush it. And there are other people that are just. Like you said, they're just the, the culture of quick fixes, of laziness, of just hand it to me of, you know. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, man, it it makes the job so hard and there's only so much we can do, you know? And sometimes, unfortunately, you got to let that one bad heifer jump the fence and leave the herd and keep focusing on the, the ones that you have that are willing to uh, put in the work. So it's, it's a sad state of events, but we we can only do so much, but with people like you out there, it's, it's more promising now. Oh, I hope so. But it's quite funny because I used to just work with people one-on-one and I got a lot of the victim mentality in those Mm -hmm. clients. But when I put my group program up, I said, like, this is what I expect from you. I expect you to do this. Here's a roadmap. This is the checkpoints where you need to be along that journey. And if you're not there, the success guarantee is not applicable because I have a success guarantee that if they can't quit the carbs after the 12 weeks, then I give them the money back. But they need to follow the, the program And people are just following it and they have much better and much quicker results than almost all of my one-on-one clients, which is amazing to me because you would have thought that working with someone one-on-one is going to give you more results. But actually, these are the the lazy people in general. They're like, well, I'm seeing Pim one-on-one, so she will fix it for me. Yep. Yep. Not everyone has that attitude, but there is a lot of that. And there's a lot more victim thinking. Whereas when they join the program, they know what's expected of them and they're just doing it. And yeah, I wonder if it being it. So part it's of kind of more, interesting. Yeah. And maybe in a tribal sort of aspect or a community of people, maybe they feel some sort mm-hmm. of, a, yeah. of a pressure uh, to, to, to succeed and to, you know, maybe lift up others around them or, Maybe even it's a fact of, you know, it's it's a, some sort of a lighthearted competition that they know that there's others involved and they Maybe. don't want to be, they don't want to be the slacker, you know? So that that's an interesting <laughs> yeah, thing to consider as well. <laughs> yeah. That's not necessarily the, the most, um, the best mindset to have, but if it works, I'm all if for it. If it works, like, yeah. It. <laughs> yeah, sometimes yeah. <laughs> competition can work wonders and, and that competitive nature and you know, we, we got to unite together as a team and climb this mountain and you sure as hell don't want to be the weak link, you know, so nobody wants to be that yeah. weak link. So maybe, maybe that has something to do with it, but that's another interesting, that's another interesting maybe. conversation down the road. But, uh, yeah. but I, I have Absolutely. kept you for well over an hour and, uh, because I could <laughs> yeah. probably talk to you all afternoon, but I know we don't have all afternoon. So, um, I'm going to let you go. And I, I often ask this question of some of my guests that I have on and not to, put you under any pressure, but, um, if you got into an elevator with someone and you know, you had one elevator ride and they handed you a thousand dollars and said real quick before this elevator door opens, what are your top three recommendations for me? And for you, it would be for me to stop eating freaking carbs and sugar. What would it be? The top, just three bullet points. 
eliminate all processed foods. Become aware of what you are thinking in every situation and learn how to feel your emotions. That's two. Or is that or was or was that a combo no, and, and you gave me three? Okay. I thought the second one was a combo <laughs> and you're gonna give me a third one. It was gonna be like this value thing, but but no, that's perfect. That's absolutely perfect. <laughs> and uh but no, that's fantastic. And I was like, I, shit, do I have to do four? <laughs> <laughs> it sounded like a comma, like a like a two and one, but but I, I I'm not gonna I'm not gonna put you on under any more pressure. Um okay. but that was great. And <laughs> So there it is. I, I think this was a phenomenal start and I knew this was going to be super, super cool. So thank you so much for being here. Um, thank you. Listen, if you're watching this, please subscribe to her channel, go through some of her videos. I've been through a bunch of them and they're all fantastic. Uh, there's a lot of quality there. And I think you're going to get a lot from uh, being a subscriber. So please do that. And I'm going to put all links, all social media, anywhere that people can contact you on the show description. But uh, before we do let you go, uh, where can everyone find you? Where's the best spot to really zone in on everything that you have to offer? If you want to learn more, then I will go to the YouTube channel. And if you search on my name, Pim Johnson, you will find it. If you are looking Looking for a community aspect and just join other like-minded people the facebook group is probably the best place and you can actually go to the youtube channel and look up on the banner and just click that so you'll get straight to the facebook group because i just changed the name so i just joined it yesterday too. i just joined the facebook group oh, yesterday so i need to prove you probably yeah so you Sorry. need to let me in what the hell yeah. <laughs> I, th Sorry. I thought you were like i'm not letting that guy in he's he's crazy <laughs> We don't I want him. Yesterday afternoon off. <laughs> yeah. So let me in, damn it. Look. Yeah, let me in. All I right. Will. That's fantastic. And don't worry, you don't have to search your name only if you want to. I'll put everything on the on the show description so you can get direct access to everything that Pim has to offer. And I hope that you'll do me the honor and privilege of coming back on in a future episode. I hope you will because I'd love to have you I would back. I'd love to. Thank you yeah, so much. Amazing. Please stay in touch. And uh, I look forward to speaking with you again. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Bye-bye, everybody.